When the gospel message of Jesus Christ first went out, it caught on like wildfire. And it spread like crazy. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were moving into this new understanding of a relationship with God that because Jesus had died on the cross for their sins and risen again from the dead, they didn't have to do anything. There was no work for them to do. There was no achievement they had to, to, uh, to accomplish in order for God to be pleased with them. But, but grace was being offered as a free gift that someone could just say, I have a relationship with God the Father because of who Jesus is, not because of who I am. And in the initial phase, it changed a lot of lives, transformed a lot of people, and it created a lot of love that spread. But as years went by and decades went by, another sort of group sort of crept into the church who had this idea that, well, I'm saved by grace, so it doesn't really matter how I live. It doesn't really matter what I do because God has covered me through the blood of Jesus. And which the apostles had to sort of respond to that and say, wait a minute, uh, that's not quite right. In fact, what was happening is inside the church, people were beginning to ask, who's the real deal and who are the phonies? And so the leaders of the church would, one by one, Apostle Paul and others would sort of address this idea. And John would write his uh, uh, sec, first, second, and third John later on to sort of describe, well, who, who's the real deal, who's the phonies? Because what the apostles had always taught was, yes, it's a free gift, but if you get the real deal, it changes you. It changes you. And Jesus had this half-brother named James. He wasn't the Apostle James, he was, uh, but he would grow to become the leader of the church. And early on, by Acts 15, he's one of the top leaders of the church. And when Peter goes and he actually witnesses to a Gentile Roman centurion named Cornelius, and the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius, Peter's yanked back to Jerusalem and have to stand in front of this council of people and give an account for himself of how is it you could share the gospel with an uncircumcised Gentile who's a Roman. And when Peter said, well, God fell on him just like us, they came up with this conclusion, I guess God's going to reach the Gentiles too. James was the leader of the church at that time, even over Peter, and he writes the letter that goes out to all of the nations to say, okay, here's, here's the deal of if you've accepted Jesus, this is kind of what we think needs to happen. Later on, James would write a letter to the entire church at large. It would be addressed to anyone who was attending any church throughout the Roman Empire. And in his letter, he would talk about this issue of if you have the real deal, it comes out in the way you behave. It wasn't that you behave right so God will love you. It's no, if you've accepted Jesus, the Holy Spirit's been placed inside you. And as a consequence, it changes how you live. And the famous line that would be quoted from his book was, faith without works is dead. He didn't mean you have to have works to get faith. What he meant was, if you have faith and there's no works to show for it, you have a dead faith. You don't have the real thing. He says, you show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works, by my deeds. And that was what he was addressing. And early on in, in the book of James, which is found near the back of the Bibles, if you want to turn there, you can. We're just going to look at one little verse today. He says this really interesting thing because the whole idea is, well, what then are the works? If God's alive and active in your heart and in your life, what is God looking for to show those changes? And here's what he says really early on in chapter 1 of verse 27 of the book he wrote, explaining to people that if you got the real deal, it changes you. He says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Here it is, bottom line. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Interesting, he says, well, he doesn't say, oh, we know, if you've got the real deal, you attend a church service and sing every Sunday. Oh, if you've got the real deal, you get together with somebody on a Tuesday night and you study a Bible verse. He, he didn't say that. What he said is, here's the real deal. If you've got the real deal, it's, how you care for the widows and the orphans and you keep yourself from being jaded and polluted and corrupted by a world system that wants to twist your mind and your heart. And the interesting thing is, the widows of his day, there is no social security system. There is no welfare system. Widows were the poorest of the poor. It took a man in those days who could own the property, who could do the work to take care of you. Family structure did it all. If you'd lost your family structure, there is no social safety net. If you're starving to death in the Roman Empire, the Romans said, let you starve. Mercy was actually not a virtue to the Romans. Compassion was not considered a virtue. So someone starving to death was, let them starve. Orphans who had no parents to take care of them, who were lost and stranded, who had no family structure to take care of them, were considered, let them die. They're worthless. They don't, they don't exist. And in comes the church saying, oh no, the least, the, the very bottom of society, the ones who are wrung out on the bottom, the widows and the orphans, how the church takes care of the least of these 
is a sign that you got the real thing when you've encountered Jesus Christ. So this Christmas season, I've decided that what we would do is interview different people who are doing some cutting edge ministries around Spokane, working with the least. And today I've asked Angela Slaybaugh to come and share with us what she's doing at an organization called Hearth Homes, which is our modern equivalent of dealing with the widows and the orphans in our modern time that James spoke about in his ancient time. Angela, would you come up? Why don't you guys give her a welcome as she comes? <laughs> All right. Welcome, Angela. Good to have you with us. Thanks. Have a seat, and let's just have our conversation here a little bit. So, Hearth Homes, <laughs> uh, first describe, what is it you guys do? So, we provide transitional housing for homeless women with children in Spokane Valley. Um, transitional housing, I think everybody has a different picture in their mind what that is. Um, so we're not in a, like a crisis shelter. We're more for women that are in recovery or more seeking to rebuild their, their lives. Um, and so it's a little bit longer stay. And if you would picture two residential homes that are rather large right next door to each other out on Broadway in Spokane Valley, um, one has four bedrooms upstairs, the other has uh, five bedrooms, and when a mom comes to move in at Hearth Homes, she gets her own room with her children. Uh, they might get a couple rooms if they're a larger family, and we do life together. So they get their room, but then uh, there's shared com common spaces like the living room, dining room, and um, we we kind of facilitate a home environment where we can focus on building community, interpersonal skills, and and relationships. So you don't you don't take the women who are like. Fresh off the street, currently addict, still a junkie, got a kid in tow. You take women who are one notch higher up. So they've exactly. been through a sobriety program at Lutheran Community Services or Union Gospel Mission or right. YWC or something. And um, and then they come into your place, and mm -hmm. it's a nice place. You, you've oh. done a good job. I mean, I've been out there and toured. It's a really cool house. And it's actually it's like family living. Yes. They finally move into mm -hmm. a home. Uh, the one house I was in had all the rooms upstairs, I think. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Five-bedroom house. Mm -hmm. Really cool kitchen, living room area, all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and so what, I mean, what uh, what kind of women, what are they like? What, what, what are their issues? What are you getting? <laughs> well, they all got the same issues we got, let's be real. But um, <laughs> they, I would say the thing that they they have in common that sets them apart is trauma. So whether that was, um, child, you know, being abused as a child growing up, rotating through the foster care system themselves, um, and then just maybe not being equipped to be a parent and out on their own, or um, trauma of domestic violence or substance abuse, and, and that's often what they turn to after they've been uh, through a traumatic experience. So, so uh, in the industry, they're called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And if you study any psychology or sociology, what's going on is that there's kind of a ranking system of if you've had, I believe it's five or more ACEs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alcoholism in the home, violence in the home, multiple moves, divorce, all mm -hmm. sorts of different issues. When you have five or six or more of these serious childhood ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, you sort of end up falling into way more likely to have mental illness, way more likely to end up in jail, way more likely to end up a drug addict, uh, just off the charts, way more likely to end up in poverty. And so the women you get have had many, many aces. Mm -hmm. They were they experienced multiple aces growing up, and now they're at this point where, you know, if they've reached the point of homelessness and needing a transitional home, their children have already experienced a few of those aces. They've got yeah. a parent that may be an addict, or they witnessed some domestic violence, and they're clearly experiencing homelessness. And so by giving them this opportunity to rebuild their lives, our hope is that the chances of, of aces occurring in their children's lives will be reduced so as they move time forward. Time to break the cycle yep. of generational poverty. And, and you, you were saying earlier that um, you don't get them. Everybody has one of two. They're either they've had uh, addiction issues or violence, mm -hmm. domestic abuse issues. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much every woman you get falls in one or both those categories. Absolutely. I don't believe we've ever had a woman that said, nope, never experienced domestic violence and never experienced drug or alcohol abuse in my life. Yeah, so, so it's, it's people who had very difficult times yes. and hard relationships. Um, you come in and one of the things is I, you were talk, telling me at one point that they've never experienced things like sitting at a dinner table. Mm -hmm. So describe what you guys do. Yeah, so we, we structure the program to um, really emphasize the relational aspect. You know, if if somebody can get a job but they don't know how to hold relationship or, or be healthy at communication, like that's not going to last ultimately and, and those cycles will begin again. So um, we, we have programming like um, 
our family dinner, Monday through Friday, all the ladies, along with a staff member or with a mentor, will um, take turns preparing dinner for the entire household. And so they're not only learning you know, time management skills, healthy food preparation and nutrition, but they're learning how to sit down as a family face-to-face -face and have meaningful conversations. Um, I had one mom you know, say, I'm learning so much in this program. And I said, can you tell me specifically something you're learning? And she said, I never knew how to have dinner as a family. And another mom said, well, we grew up, you weren't allowed to talk at the dinner table. And then other moms, you know, they're really rusty. And so they might start talking about something like, maybe that's not healthy for the kiddos to hear about their AA group that day or something they're angry about. And so when mentors and staff can come alongside and build them up and coach them in how to like, well, how can we redirect this conversation so that it's positive for the kids' experience and, and for the others around here and for this to be kind of a sacred time to just be in community. To, and, and that's powerful. Because a lot of these ladies, to them, conversation is always shaming, sarcasm, guilt, mm -hmm. um, complaining. Mm -hmm. it's, all, it's dark and negative. So Absolutely. So you guys sort of shift the topics to say, we're going to sit at the table and have positive talks. Sure. But what are kind of the, some of the topics you guys have recently? So just this last week, one of the moms asked um, all the ladies, if you had a day with no limitations and no expectations, what would you do with it and why? And so it, I mean, sometimes they go really deep with this and like you, you see things that you would have, you wouldn't have never heard. And then for them to be able to just kind of imagine this, you know, opportunity or, or just be really positive, you know, sometimes they're just fun and silly. Like if you could have any superpower, what would it be? And, and to get the kids involved and know like this is a safe place for us to kind of dream together and just enjoy, reflect on the positive things, highlights of the day, like that is all so rich. And, and I mean, there are studies out there that show families that dine together regularly, they, they experience fewer risk factors, their kids do. Because if you think about it, you're going to notice at the dinner table if your child's behavior has changed, you know, so did something happen at school today or is, is something going on? You know, we recognize that the ladies are having a really good day and we're like, what's going on? Everybody's just like charged today versus there's clearly a dynamic going on right now because, you know, people aren't talking at all. So um, it's really powerful. It's Just a good time. teach them the art of positive yes. conversation. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about your pantry and your boutique. Sure. So um, we, we have to keep the house with food in order to be able to do these family dinners and supply the ladies with the food. They get food stamps, but we cannot, by law, require that they use anything that they buy for a program meal. And so we partner with local churches, civic groups, and so forth that um, will help stock our pantry. And so the ladies, when they meet with um, the, the Life Skills Program Coordinator each week, they coordinate what they're going to, to make. And then they go into the pantry just like they would have to shop and get the ingredients to make what they're going to make. And, and that's been really amazing because when I first came there, the budget was kind of eaten up by food purchases and things like that. And we got a Kiwanis group in there that built this amazing pantry. And then that same week that it was built, University Elementary had done a food drive. We had no idea what's going on. And they dropped off 500 cans of food and just stocked our, our pantry. So it's, I mean, that's an amazing part of being in ministry is you can just see God's provision so keenly in those things. And then there's the boutique, um, which is a really fun aspect. You know, initially when I got there, people would just drop off donations. And some people are very intentional and they drop off things that would be meaningful for these moms and children. And others are just cleaning out their closets and getting rid of stuff. And so um, they were initially just giving it to the ladies. And what we did was we, we got some amazing volunteers that will come in and they'll sort out what would be fitting for the moms, for their sizes, their styles, and for the kiddos, um, things that are needed. And we put it in this boutique that ranges from clothing and accessories to diapers and feminine hygiene and all that stuff. And then the ladies get to shop a couple times a month and they use their house bucks. So when they set their goals for the week, they get to put like a dollar amount on what that's worth to them. Because that's their job while they're at Hearth Homes is moving forward in their goals. And it may not look like just work, you know, and going to a job, it might be intensive outpatient for treatment services or counseling. And so when they, when they achieve a goal and they say like, hey, I, you know, I went to this or completed this class, they get their boutique bucks and they go in and shop. And so they have this sense of pride and ownership in the things that they're accumulating. And it's not just, um, you know, because I, I feel bad and I don't want to tell this person no that's trying to give me their whole wardrobe left over. You know, they get to choose it. And that's empowering. Yeah. yeah. And you've, you guys have sorted through all the donations, and so you'll, you kind of take the best of the best and the right sizes yep. and the right things. That's right. Yep. I used to drive me nuts. We'd do the meal downtown. We'd ask for clothes donations, and people bring down, like, Red Ladies pumps. 
It's like, oh yeah, yeah, all the homeless guys on the street are really looking for a pair of those. <laughs> um, thanks for the donation, you know. So, um, you, uh, how many ladies a year kind of come through your program? So this last year we had 19 moms and 28 kiddos. Not all at once, so kind of nope. spread out. What's That's right. The average, week? well, it, it just depends. Um, uh, on average, ladies stay about eight months this last year, seven or eight months, and there were 19 families. Um, and so it ranges. We could have, you know, um, six or seven families, uh, and then another time we might have five because they're larger families and taking up a couple rooms. So it yeah. just it varies. So you guys, uh, there's two houses side by side mm -hmm. on Broadway, mm -hmm. and one's sort of the entry level house. You come into the program first, you're there, and you sort of earn your way up to the second house, which is part of the whole. We took away the physical component. Uh, we were doing that, and then we found like, why would they need to move one more time while they're in our program? So we actually moved it to a phase where okay. we're we're um, we're really adamant about examining like, are we putting a carrot in front of people and having this external motivator? Or are we helping the ladies identify their values? And so we move to a phase model, which is more abstract. And it's more about like in that first phase, are you connecting with the program, the resources around you, that kind of thing. And then the second phase is engagement, where we focus more on like that communication and building like, are you, you you're in the seat at the dinner table, but are you engaged with your kiddos? Are you engaged with the people around you? And then the third level is um, ownership of being beyond that victim mentality of like, oh, I'm doing this because I have to do this. It's like, no, this this is my choice, and I'm choosing to self-evaluate on these things. And ultimately, that goes to the fourth phase of transformation of like, what is your big goal for you? And, and our mission is transforming the lives of homeless women and children through Christian love, hope, and faith. But ultimately, transformation is going to come down to the women that, that want it and receive it. You know, because it can be yeah. put out before them, but if they're not ready to own those choices and, you know, really go for what is going to be most valuable and not just, I want my kid back. I want my kid back from maybe CPS, if that's what they're working towards, is very different from, I want to be a mom that's equipped to care for my children for the long term. And that's what we're really working with the ladies on is, is what is the difference between that carrot and that that mastery of this, like, I want this transformation. Yeah, the difference between performing for someone else or actually wanting a life for themselves. Yes. And it's it's a difficult when you are perhaps you're the only place where a woman who has lost her children to child protective services and is trying to get them back can actually, when she gets her kids back, can stay where she lives. Right. It's it's one of the weird things. The system isn't isn't as smooth as you think. <laughs> that most people would say, most middle class people would say, if you've had a child, you should be able to care for that child. And if you can't, we'll create a system with Child Protective Services to help you go through these steps to get your child mm -hmm. back. Well, one of the loopholes in the system that currently exists is the vast majority of housing is either a mom without kids or a mom with kids. So the mom who has lost her kids to Child Protective Services and then does all the steps she needs to get sober, get clean, get stabilized so she can get her kids back, the moment she gets her kid back, can no longer live there and she's homeless again yep. immediately. And so it's like, uh, okay, well, this is sort of a system rigged for failure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that, it's not to say to everybody, oh, yeah, so the moment you get your kid back, you didn't turn to a homeless mom with a kid, and there's nowhere to spend the night that night. And so you are one of the few places, the only place in Spokane, mm -hmm. where once a woman does all the steps she needs to get her kids back, gets to stay where she lives. Yeah. You're yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, this may be the first time that they are being mom, clean, and sober. And so to have a mom that is like in that situation where, okay, you get your child back, but now you're homeless and all of this, that amount of stress, like where do you think that leads a mom to that is in addiction recovery? Like their old coping skills or that's, you know, has managed to remove herself from a domestic violence relationship, which is often why the, mom, the children are removed in the first place. And now they're homeless, but they have this guy in their ear saying like, well, just come move in with me. I'll take care of you. And the cycle begins again. Yeah. yeah. We would think, I mean, it seems like common sense to most of us, right, that a woman who's doing everything she can to get her kids back finally does it and then loses her home because she mm -hmm. got her kids back. Mm -hmm. To us, that feels like, well, that should be a common sense thing. Yeah. But what you find when you get into the systems is this group of bureaucrats don't talk to this group mm -hmm. of bureaucrats. And what we have is an incredibly inefficient system right. that actually is rigged to fail. And uh, so it's like, and, and the, the people working in the trenches can always see it. And somehow the higher-ups in the state right. and then the federal government never seem to figure right. it out. That well, and you're the, talking about funding streams, and you're yeah. talking about policy, and so it has to be very black and white. But yeah, in those bureaucrats situations... Bureaucrats like it black and white, yeah. but life isn't black no, and white. I'm, it's always shades no. of gray. So, <laughs> That's right. Now, you'll have ladies who don't make it. They don't make it through your system. There's... 
Yeah, we'll have women that, you know, maybe they only make it through that connection phase and, and maybe they just wanted a place to stay, like, and I'm not really interested in that, that long-term thing, you know, they might be externally motivated. And so we come up with a plan like, okay, clearly, like, you've achieved what you wanted to at this time and, and we won't be able to continue to house you unless you're working towards this greater, you know, overall big picture goal. And, and there are times, I mean, relapse is part of recovery. You know, if anybody here has ever known somebody that struggled with alcoholism or drug addiction, you know, we have to face the fact that relapse is part of it. And it's very hard to be in a society that's so performance-based and people will ask me, well, what are your success measures? What's your success count? It's like, you know, we're Christ-centered. And, and last time I looked, it said, serve the least of these, not serve the least of these and get fabulous results. And, and that's really hard to reconcile in, you know, a society that says like, well, we want clean, sober, and forever with a job. Like, then you haven't met this population. Yeah. It's, and their struggles are work. very different than ours. And so um, we really, you know, there'll be women that maybe they choose to use while they're with us and they relapse. And we let them know we support your choice to leave based on your actions. And that wording is very intentional because oftentimes in addiction or in domestic violence or just any of our unhealthy cycles, we'll tend to go into this victim mindset of like, you're kicking me out, you're doing this thing. And, and the thing is, is what was the choice that led up to this consequence we had already discussed? That power was and is completely yours. And I've had women that come back to us, um, you know, via Facebook or will pop over after they have chosen to leave by their actions and come back and say, thank you. Yeah. That was what I needed. It, it was a rough go after leaving in that. And then we've had other moms that, you know, will be, you know, popping over and saying, hey, three years sober today. Thank you. Like, I've got my child. I'm still in my apartment. And life as a single mom is always going to be a struggle. But I know how to cope with the stressors, and I'm not turning to the bottle for that. That's huge. That's a huge deal. The um, Providence Healthcare teaches a workshop. They run it about once a quarter um, about communicating in the culture of poverty. Fantastic mm -hmm. workshop. It it, it's free to take if you can get in, but it fills up super fast. Mm -hmm. It's based on Donna Beagle's book, who's a um, she got two PhDs from Portland State University. She grew up in poverty. But one of the things the workshop teaches is that people in poverty culture always think life happens to them. It just, it's what happens to you. Life just happens to you. And there's never been a mindset that I create the life that happens to me. Mm -hmm. That my choices, my decisions, what, what I do, where I go, who I communicate with, whether I use drugs or not, or whether I mouth off, it, they never, it never dawns on that, that actually they're creating what's happening. Um, and that's one of the hardest things to overcome with poverty culture people is they feel life happens to them. Mm -hmm. You were saying earlier that sort of this discussion too about coming to terms with um, the job, holding down a job versus loving your kids. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not easy to, mm -hmm. to reconcile. Talk a little sure. bit about that. Well, we have, um, this is something that comes up often. We have volunteer mentors. We have five ladies that come in and do life with the women at Hearth Homes. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because... Um, you know, staff are there and, and, you know, my background is social work. And so I'm understanding some of the dynamics behind what's going on and the mental health issues and whatnot. And sometimes mentors wrestle with the world's view of success, right? Is, well, they're going to come into hearth homes and they're going to whip it into shape and they're going to go get a job and everything's going to be peachy. And, and I'm going, okay, hold on to your seat <laughs> because it's not going to be anything like that. You know, once in a while we'll have a woman that has, you know, maybe she was born into... Um, you know, a, a stable family. And maybe, you know, she had a good set of skills where she can read, she can write, she knows how to communicate well. She got into a bad relationship and she gave us a call when her boyfriend had kicked her out and she's living in her car. And she was with us 60 days. And in that time, she was able to get a full-time job. And we plugged her in with some rapid free housing resources and she's back on her feet and she's okay. She was raised with a skill set that really allowed her to be successful in that amount of time. Successful. Then we have other moms that were a product of incest and living with this horrible shame. And now they have children that, you know, maybe have been abused and been um, seen things. And so now they're ashamed because they expose their children to this and they have learning disabilities and struggling with borderline personality disorder. And just learning to live with that, I think, is more than enough. And for us to say, go out and get a job is just a total injustice. And to yeah. compare two women that are totally different is just, that is, is not what Jesus asks us to do. Yeah, and a, a, a kind of that blatant 
unthinking middle class answer to poverty people is just go get a job. Go get a job. It'll all work out fine. Well, when you're a single mom and you don't have a skill set and the job you can get is entry level jobs, mm -hmm. the first thing is taking care of your children during the day, child care, mm -hmm. toddler care. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody is almost, it's, yeah. it's astronomically expensive <laughs> and it, it means you can't hold down the job or you get the job, but you actually can't earn a living because right. the amount of money you make at the job does nothing right. but pay for the daycare. And should you miss a day of work, you're completely expendable. You know, so if your kiddo gets sick and can't go to childcare that day because their their policy is we don't take sick kiddos, then you know this this forward movement you had is now two steps back, and you're yeah. going to lose. So all, all the social workers who deal with poverty culture and housing issues and stuff, they're all aware, and they we've discussed at length at the Spokane Homeless Coalition mm -hmm. is childcare is a massive issue for poverty culture. Huge need. And we could figure out a way that if we could figure out a way that poverty culture could get toddler care and daycare. There's very, very little daycare for someone of poverty culture where they can take their kid and get, hey, my, my kid can go to a daycare center and be cared yep. for so that I can yep. work. It's tough. Yes. It's a tough cycle. What's your, what's your guys' budget a year, and how do you, how do you make money? Small. Uh, our budget is about $115,000, and that is everything from staff, property. We house you know, almost 20 families in a year on that, and, and that is very very small if you're not familiar with nonprofit budgets. Yeah. Um, and it is completely private, so it's individual donors, um, some some business donations, a couple grants from foundations, and um, one small city grant. And so we, we operate on a shoestring, and we do that because we really focus on the community caring for their own. So providing opportunities to congregations and to civic groups and saying, like, hey, do you want to take care of light bulbs? at hearth homes for the entire year. Can you just sponsor that? And then can this group, can you just do paper towels? And will you do a food drive? And when we do that, like we see this budget go so much further and we see a community that is saying, well, we want to help. We just don't know how. Let's give them that opportunity. And then of course, there's always going to be that need for people to partner financially. And, and you know, that's, it's not, um, it's not just fundraising. It's really, I think, looking to the church and saying like, Christ commands us to give. He's given to us. So how are we being faithful in partnering with ministries in town, our own church and others, to care for the needs of the widows and the orphans and the, you know, those that are suffering from addiction and all of that? Like we that that's a bigger command. I would love if, you know, we had fifty people become, you know, donors at five dollars a month that just housed two families at Hearth Homes. That's tremendous. And, and you did it $5 a month. That's not a big deal, right? Yeah. Um, but I think people get in that mindset of like, well, I don't have enough to make a difference. And it, you really do. Yeah. And whether it's at Hearth Homes or Union Gospel Mission or, you know, the local charity of your choice, it just are we giving? Are we a church that's actually being faithful to what Christ has commanded us to? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great, it's, it's hard to understand how little, little it takes to actually help. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a ton. It doesn't yeah. take, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just not a plumber. I'm not the level where I've achieved to be a philanthropist. It's like, yeah, <laughs> we're talking pretty small donations yep. to make it work. Yep. And then you have to do fundraisers and things all the time. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got one next week? Next week, yeah, we're doing um, at Civic Theater, White Christmas. It's going to be a great play. It's a musical. And tickets are $45, and every penny goes to Hearth Home. So, you know, you think a $45 ticket. Well, you just fed a family for an entire week at Hearth Homes. For forty five dollars, yeah, and, and you, you know, get to play out for free. You get a great you look show. at it that way. Go see, yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, Civic Theater Wednesday night, White Christmas, forty five dollar ticket. But you know, hey, I get a free show, and I support a hard yep. family for yep. their meal for a week. And exactly, you can't really beat that. That's no. that's kind of a win all the way around. It's fun. Yeah. All right, so Angela, you are growing up as a little girl, dreaming that when I am an adult, I want to work with former addicts and. <laughs> Slightly mentally ill and violence abuse. That's what I want to do with my life. Mm. That's how it was when you were a little girl growing up. Huh? Yeah, I think I Tell had us. that exact thought at five years old. <laughs> Tell us your story. <laughs> how so, do you end up doing this? Yeah, well, okay, so if you start in the way back, like, I think just innately, I have, I have always had this draw to um, the hurting. And you know, my parents would always joke with me, oh, you always bring home the strays and all of this. And um, that those were my friends. And, and honestly, I think it played into some dynamics at home. Like I had a pretty dysfunctional relationship home, very codependent. And so, you know, in my, my early college years, I came face to face with friends that were suffering from addiction. And I'm going like, this is terrifying. 
And then I learned about codependency and I'm going like, I'm as much a part of this as the addict is. And, and I think um, when I came to Christ at, at 21, he really like reached into my life and, and to, like showed me what boundaries were with unhealthy people. And because, you know, we're taught to love unconditionally, right? But at what cost? And that's, that's I think, the, where the enemy kind of twists the truth. You know, yes, we are called to love unconditionally and grace is very much a part of that. But you don't, you, you can love someone and not go near them ever again. That's okay, you know? And, and learning that through my walk with Christ, um, you know, I thought I was going to be a pilot. That was the trajectory I was on in, in, uh, in college. And then when I gave my life to Christ and asked God, like, well, I should probably inquire, what, what do you want me to do with my life? And, and he very clearly directed me towards the, the School of Social Work. And I got my bachelor's at uh, Eastern. And I was the first in my family to go to four-year college and never had thought about grad school until I'm in my final year of my bachelor's and thought, you know, I want a more diverse experience. So naturally, I chose a school down in New Orleans to go get my master's in social work. And I spent about four years down there. And It was a very diverse program. Yes, it was, there was international focus, there was clinical focus, and there was community level focus. And I wanted something that would be that spectrum because I just wasn't sure what, what God was going to use me in specifically. And that, that was, uh, I think you said Tulane, Tulane, Tulane University. University down in New Orleans. Yeah. And yeah. you're down there four years. I was, I was just down there for school for one. It was a little, like a abbreviated master's program. And after graduating, I thought I was going to come back to Spokane. This was home to me. And so I had applied for some jobs up here, one of which was at Hearth Homes. And they called me and they offered me a position that was unpaid live-in position. And my faith was not at a point where, with all these grad school loans, that I was like ready to work for free somewhere. And yes, I really... And that's, non, that's the nonprofit that's world for you right very there. Very altruistic. Come and, come and yes. live in this house for free and run our program. We'll just go yes. ahead and give you a place to live. Yeah. It, yeah. it always seems like it's that. And I always wonder, well, how, how do these guys run Red, Clo- Red Cross for 700000 a year salaries, uh-huh. right? It's, it's that other end of the nonprofit yes. oh, spectrum, yeah. but yeah, yeah. most social workers end up at this end Very of the spectrum. Very true. Well, and, and at that time, I didn't feel like I, I actually prayed on it some more, and I felt like God was keeping me in New Orleans. So I stayed there for a few more years, and I worked in rural Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi in... Uh, first, Forest of the Poor in America. It is like another country. Like, if you've not been to rural South, like, I highly recommend you've got a mission trip right there. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? that's third world. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I, I had the... I had the privilege of, of working in homes, um, doing you know early childhood uh, literacy programs that I was supervising and training, and HIV AIDS work, which was just tremendous because the, the segregation, discrimination down there alone, just because of you know of the race issues. But then you add an HIV diagnosis to that, and that was just a whole experience. But um, so I got to a point with my job that I was doing a lot of administrative work, supervisory, and I said, God, I want to be in the trenches. Like, I feel like this isn't what you have for me right now. I feel like you want me somewhere in the trenches. Give me, give me some promptings of where you want me to apply and, and check out. And I'm driving back from, I think, vacation in Texas or something one weekend, and I get a phone call from the founder at Hearth Homes, and they say, we found your application from a couple years ago. What are you doing with your life? I was like, well, <laughs> I was praying for God to tell me maybe where he wants me next. And they said, well, we, we have a need for a live-in house manager. It's slightly paid. It was a stipend. Um, and, and we really feel like you would be a fit, but we don't want to, you know, disrupt your life and have you move all the way up here for that if it's not. And I was like, no, I really want to look at this. Like, I've been praying. because yeah, you're so. from here, family's here, yep. and you're like, you're ready to yep. come back. It was, it was time to come back. Um, and... And so I came up um, for a couple weeks, actually, and I did an interview. And by the time I got up here for the interview, they told me that they filled the position they were looking at me for, but they still have that unpaid live-in position. What a sweet deal. (laughs) Yeah. And so when I show up, I go, okay, well, if this is what God wants, like, I'm going to press forward. Like, I felt that stirring in my spirit. Like, you don't pray and say, like, hey, God, like, tell me where you want me next and get a phone call like that and go, like, waiting for the next one. Tell me what else do you have, you know? It's like, okay, God, like, this is what I'm going to do. And I showed up and, you know, these these houses, when they were purchased, one was donated and the other was purchased with collateral from the other house. They were HUD foreclosures. They were fixer-uppers. And they had not quite been fixed up by the time I got there. And Walking in the door of Hearth Homes, knowing that I'm going to be living there and not being paid, I have nothing, 
and walking in and my heart just kind of sinking in my gut going, oh, Lord. Because yeah, a HUD foreclosure definitely, I mean, you're talking a slum. Yeah. It, it, it was a slum. When, it you're, was when you're already HUD, you're kind of at the bottom of the run. Yes. When you're a HUD foreclosure, yes. you're a slum. Yes. And they had, they had straightened it up, I would say. Yeah. But it was by no means fixed. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like, I don't know what was, you would call that. And There's a good But you're feeling God for say, it. God is still saying to you, yeah, this is what yeah, I have Yeah, absolutely. I felt that and I was like, okay. And so then I get a phone call that the executive director has resigned. Probably walked into the place and saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the executive director has resigned. And by the way, we had to let the house manager go. Are you interested in the executive director position? Let me get this right. I'm the executive director. I'm the house manager. And I'm the assistant house manager. I am it. You're it. You're the staff. Yeah. So I, yeah, I've so been I asked, to myself where I was the sole staff. Oh, yes. Still and staff I, meetings were very argumentative. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you just can't agree there. on anything. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I meet with myself and... <laughs> uh, yeah. Really give yourself heck. Um, yeah, so so um, came up, moved in. I lived at Hearth Homes for 13 months. Um, and it, it was very much like, you know, assembling a plane while you're flying it already. There were women living there. And I had never had a conversation with a woman that was actively on meth before. But now I'm in this situation where I'm going to have to ask her to leave because this is a clean and sober environment. And she's going, well, not according to how I've been the last month. And I'm like, well... I have to ask you to We're leave. That's support your thing. choices yeah, to leave. I support your choice to leave based <laughs> on your choice to use. Um, and so this was just a huge learning curve. And I would say in that season of my life, I have never been on my face in prayer, seeking God's leading, like ever. And, and it was so precious. Like there's, there's part of me that misses that very much and wishes that I would have that kind of like total and utter dependence on God every day. And, and I'm thankful that I'm in a new season. Hearth Homes is in a new season. You know, what started out as putting out fires and figuring out like, well, what do we do in this situation? To now having a program and phases that we're talking to ladies about and a curriculum. And we moved away from the live-in model because if there's something I learned in 13 months, women will make the choice whether you are in the room next to them or not. And if you've ever had a teenager, you probably will know that to be true as well, right? And so I want to empower these women. I want to instill in them that they can run their own home. They can practice the communication skills that we're talking about, and I don't have to be there in order for it to happen. And so we, we've moved to a supportive, you know, where we, um, we have rotating staff, but it's not 24-7, and no one's living there holding anyone's hand. And yeah. it's been really amazing to see that kind and, of... And one growth. of your goals when you first moved in, mm -hmm. well, it sounds like for yourself too, but also for mostly for the ladies, was you wanted to create an environment that was happy to come to. So you went mm -hmm. to the slum, and the first thing you're like is, we got to fix this slum. Absolutely. Well, I think God brought me to Hearth Homes, no pay, you know, living in, so that I was walking in with the, the exact same investment that the ladies do. I've got nothing, and here I'm walking through this door. And if my heart is sinking when I get there, yeah. what what is this environment? Ex how is this an expression of God's love for the ladies? And so we didn't even have anyone in one of the houses for about eight, like six or eight months. And we had volunteer groups come out. And I'll tell you, I just shared the opportunity in our community. When I tell people in Spokane Valley, you know, 774 children were identified as homeless last year during the school year. Their jaws drop. People have no idea that homelessness is an issue. Yeah, and that's just the valley. There's over 2,000 exactly, in the county. Exactly. 2,000 homeless students are in our school system. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. there is a need and there is a way to get out there. You know, having groups adopt bedrooms and put, put in a new bunk bed and some bedding and, and make it a place where, you know, when a mom is coming from Union Gospel Mission, you know, and sharing a room with three other families in this like one level, single level motel style living, and they come in and they say, this is mine or I get a key. This is the first time in three years I've had a key to my own home. Like yeah. that, that has a tremendous impact on women. And it's a, I mean, you've done an incredible job because it's a cute place. And you walk in and it feels good. You, know, you don't need to meet anybody. It feels good. And so for a lot of the ladies I'm sure you're getting, it's probably the, the nicest home they've ever lived in in their mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. That they've come out of poverty and apartment Absolutely. to apartment, slum to slum. And, and God willing, they will have this experience. And like, you know, it's going, being a single mom, it will be a struggle the rest of their lives for all the reasons you, child care, pay, all, working, all of that stuff. It's going to be a struggle. But if you have experienced life and you have seen what life can be, then you have something to aim for. But if all you have ever been shown is this one reality, you don't really even know that, that there is more possible. Yeah. And you have a cute playground yeah. out there. 
So you have people who come out. If someone's uh, here right now listening and they're like, hey, I'd like to get involved. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do something mm -hmm. beyond the $5 a month or whatever. Right. What, what are the kind of things people do when they volunteer? Sure, sure. So everything from like adopting a bedroom, like that's a great group activity is to adopt a bedroom and flip it and make it nice and refreshed for a new family. Um, we have a huge property and we have 10 garden beds. And so there's plenty of yard work. And then these were HUD foreclosures and there's continued to be you know, little anomalies, whether it's changing the light bulbs and, you know, rewiring something or, you know, fixing the linoleum that's peeling up. And, you know, we've got one awesome volunteer that is making a proposal for our basement because we really need new carpet down there and we want to make it more kid friendly. And so, you know, there, from grant writing to event planning to childcare, like there is so much opportunity at Hearth Homes. And, you know, we, we really work with the volunteers to understand, like, we're doing with the ladies. So if you want to come out and do garden beds, we're going to do that with the ladies' investment so that they have some ownership over it and really enjoy that. And, you know, there's so many opportunities. Our website has them all listed. And, the website is, so they, or they can yeah. just talk to you afterwards. Absolutely. Here. I'll be hanging out afterwards. Yeah. It's, uh, it's hard to imagine, but there's some people that it's a long way to re-inspire hope. Mm-hmm that they never had it or yep. it was lost when they were little. Um, and to reignite hope in someone yeah. is not a conversation. It's a long journey yeah. of walking beside them, constantly affirming, getting them to the place where they finally really do believe again that life can, could be something Absolutely. else. Absolutely. And you guys, yeah. your poverty culture is tough to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, we got about 10 minutes. Let's field some questions. Anybody got questions for Angela, something you'd like to ask or follow up on at all? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, where do the women go after they leave hearth homes? And it varies. Um, you know, a lot of, most of the women go on to permanent housing. So we help them find resources or they're able to get a job in some cases and get stable permanent housing, which might be an apartment. Um, others, like I, we had one mom that came with us for about two and a half months. And she was really wrestling, like really deepening her faith and really struggling with anxiety and she needed more intensive services and more intensive help with her children than even we could offer. And so we prayed alongside her and encouraged her to get into Anna Ogden Hall. And that was one of the programs that she went, that we've had women go into. Um, and so we really love working with our partners. And, and the most important thing is finding a program that's a fit for, for a mom. Because there's times when they come to us and it's just not a fit. And, you know, we we'll field a lot of phone calls a week that, you know, I'm ready to leave my husband you know, and I'm not sure what to do next. So we'll guide them through that process of going to like the domestic violence shelter or something like that. Cause we can't be the fit for everyone, but there are good resources out there that can be connected yeah. with. Yeah. If you ever have a conversation with someone who's trying to flee domestic violence, uh, the best places in Spokane are the YWCA that has a fantastic mm -hmm. program for that. Uh, Lutheran community services, yeah. outstanding, especially on the legal side. Yeah. Um, Union gospel missions, crisis shelter. Those mm -hmm. are the three like Right now, where are you going to go tonight with your kids? Yep. Those would be the three exactly. places to go if you're ever having that conversation. You guys are slightly later after they've been yep. through one of those. Once they have a safety plan in place, then we move then, on. Then they can move advance to mm -hmm. hearth homes. Okay. I think we have a question back there. <sighs> How do we spiritually feed the women? Well, I think it's that um, I'm going to show you my faith by my works, right? And this is something very early on when I came in, um, we wrestled with as a board and, and, and with the program is, do we, are we a ministry that says, you know, every Sunday we're all going to church and that's a requirement? Um, this is when our Bible study is and this is when we're going to do it. Well, the fact of the matter is we won't turn people away that aren't of the faith. We let them know we're Christ-centered and that we may open, we, we do open up our, our meal times and our family meetings with prayer and devotionals, but you are never required to pray, you are never required to go to church and never required to do Bible study. We do require, as part of our, um, our own uh, accountability, is that our leadership, meaning our staff and our board and the mentors who work deeply connected with the women, are all Christ followers um, because we want to make sure that we are living it out and walking it out. And, you know, by the grace of God, we will have those opportunities to speak into their lives. But you guys have Bible studies. You have, and you will share biblical counsel, those kinds of things and Absolutely. situations. We generally do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Like when, when women are going through things, we offer up prayer. Would you like us to pray with you? And some women are like, stay away from me with a 10-foot pole on that prayer. And I, I have one mom that she was with us. Um, she graduated or left our program, transitioned out about two years ago. And I still meet with her monthly. She calls me her mentor. 
And she has not accepted Christ into her life. And she has been one of those, like, stay away from me with your Bible. But she still wants to be fed. And we're willing yeah. to do that. And, and that is one thing, like, if you can't come alongside as a monthly financial partner and you don't have time to volunteer, please be praying for us on that. And that, you know, we don't, we don't get fertile soil often at Hearth Homes. We get the rocky, hard we're exhausted by the end of the end of the day of tilling the soil, and our mentors are exhausted, and we're exhausted trying to explain to them that that's part of the process. And we may plant a seed, but it may be three years down the line, thirty years down the line, that something sprouts and grows. And I'm fa- I, I am trusting God to that. Yeah. It's uh, we we learned right away when we were doing uh, 150, feeding 150 people every week downtown, which are homeless. Yeah. It was very rare to re- talk to someone who wasn't preached at. Yeah. They'd all had to hear the sermon to get the sandwich. They'd all been through the, I got the code yep. if, I list, if I did the worship mm-hmm. service. They'd been through, and to them it was a con game. Yep. The whole gospel presentation was a con game. I pretend to accept your Jesus, and you give me a coat and a sandwich, and then I play you a little bit more telling you how I lost my medications on yep. your prescription drug money. Yep. So that's all it was. It's just one more, one more person in society asking them to put on a mask. Yes. And we want to be in an environment where you can be transparent, where we don't have to focus just on the behavior, but we can look at the heart and go, well, what's going on down here? And that's, that's more important to us, authenticity. And, and Christ calls us to be a confessing community. And so I'm, you know, if I'm the executive director and I'm the one leading my team, I have to be the first one willing to do a self-evaluation when I blow it. Because if I don't do that, we're just going to be a fake it till you make it kind of program. Yeah. And we don't want to be that. So, okay. Other questions someone may have. Angela, we, I mean, it's inspiring work that you do. It's amazing. I, and I'm listening to your story about how you kind of ended up working there. I was thinking as you were speaking to tell people out there, if you're wondering what the call of God sounds like in people's lives, it often sounds like that. Mm-hmm. It often sounds like, here, here's an opportunity for you with no money, no pay, in a difficult situation. Are you willing to do it? Um, and I've, t- I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people who followed Jesus and, you know, it's not always, hey, here's a $100,000 salary in a nice home. Go do my work for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, it's almost never that. Yeah. The call of God often looks like, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a difficult situation. Are you willing to do it? He that is faithful and little will then be made faithful in yeah. much, is the way the scriptures would phrase it. Um, so if you're in a place in your own life where you're like, you know, I'm getting tired. I want to do something new and fresh, something different. Um, it might be worth it to say, uh, God might call you to do something radical with yourself. He might call you to do something that's very different. He might call you to do something that is not a smooth transition, but it's his call in your life. And down the road, um, you'll be glad you did. Mm-hmm. There was nothing comfortable about Jesus' life. And, and I think that's a good reminder to me when I'm whining to myself about how, how much this hurts right now or how much of a struggle this is. But that joy and the sorrow of knowing like when you're getting sharpened, when you're getting like filed down, when he is putting you to the fire, like... He's bringing out something that's more precious and a greater reflection of him. And, you know, I tell people when I do presentations in the community, like, if you feel that stirring in your heart, you're going to hear that voice that says you're not equipped, you don't know what to do. Just say yes. Just show up because God is so faithful in equipping us where he calls us. He doesn't do it beforehand, typically. Yeah. Can you? Can we pray for you? Why don't we all stand and pray for Angela as we close the service today? Thank you. Oh. Lord Jesus, God Almighty, King of the universe, we just lift Angela up to you as she stands here really in behalf of Hearth Homes as an organization. First off, we just pray, Lord, that you would bless her life personally, that you would pour your spirit out in her home, in her mind, in her heart, Lord, in all of her relationships, in her family, in her finances. And then, Lord, we ask you to just sort of flow down to the organization of Hearth Homes. We pray that you would meet all of their financial needs and that you would do it with many sources from many places that, uh, that, that hundreds, maybe even thousands of people would be able to say, yeah, I have a hand in that. Yeah, I'm making a difference. That you would bring participation, not just money, but participation along with it. Lord, we pray for the children who are in Hearth Homes, who will be those who are there now, those who are going to be coming this year, that you would break the curse of the cycle of poverty and abuse and addiction, that you would break it in this generation at this time, that they would be the children who rise up and are raised differently than all the generations that have come before in their family line. Pray that you would give protection to them and healing in their hearts and minds. We pray for the women who are there now and the ones who will come later, Lord, that you would bring healing to them. They too, Lord, would be the ones who break the cycle of the curse of poverty and addiction and shame and guilt and abuse in their lives. 
Lord, may your spirit hover over hearth homes. May it be sacred ground that the people who uh, step onto those grounds and walk in those homes would know it feels different. It, it, it's a completely different place and it would be because your Holy Spirit resides there. May your blessing and your peace and your joy rest upon Angela and upon hearth homes. We give this as a prayer gift on behalf of all of us at the Gathering House. In your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, if you want to stay a little longer, get involved, and you want to follow up with Angela, of course, she'll be here having a conversation, get a cup of coffee, and she would love to talk to you. God bless you guys. Thank you.